everyone. If you are turning in from Europe or Middle East, it's evening time. Good afternoon if you are in the East Coast. And good morning if you are joining us from the West Coast. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Dr. Sultan Al-Fawaz. And in the name of the International Council for Education and Air Sensor Integration and the Autism Center of Excellency, I welcome you all to our webinar, which we are going to um, talk and at the same time celebrate the historic recognition of air sensor integration as evidence-based intervention for individuals with autism. We are honored to welcome our panelists who represent excellency and collaboration in the field of research and practice in air sensor integration. Many thanks to their collective research, publication and advocacy advocacy effort which yield to this recognition by the National Clearinghouse on Autism Evidence and Practice, NCAEP. Um, so I was thinking, let's take a brief review um, of the two hosting entities, um, ICE, uh, International Council for Education, Air Sensor Integration, and talk about Autism Center of Excellency as both of them are nonprofit organization and hosting this amazing, hope, uh, hopefully, I, I would argue and I would say amazing panel. <laughs> so, um, International Council for Education Air and Air Sensory Integration, our three main objectives is to provide an inclusive, supportive community which promote uh, the best practice and work to raise the standard of education and training in air sensory integration. We're hoping that our collective work will uh, promote and support research with a network in air sensory integration and uphold the standard of education in air sensory integration. On behalf of the executive committee, uh, Mr. Paulo Fernandez, uh, the president, Dr. Isabel uh, Baudry, and Dr. Claudia O'Meary, the secretary, and uh, Thor, the vocal, uh, and the other members of uh, international of the International Council for Education and Sensor Integration, I would like to thank you. Um, for uh, this opportunity and I would like to thank my team, um, especially the executive committee, um, without their support um, and uh, efforts throughout um, this process, I wouldn't be able to execute this uh, webinar. So uh, thank you, Paolo, Isabel, Claudia and Thor. Um, and I would like to thank you guys again for accepting uh, our invitation and hopefully we'll be able to uh, invite you and other um, experts in the field for future webinars. Gracious. In collaboration with Autism Center of Excellency, um, where I take the um, responsibility of leading the occupational therapy department. Uh, we will hopefully host many webinars like this webinar to increase the awareness about evidence-based practice and air sensory integration. So Autism Center of Excellency is a newly established center in Saudi Arabia. I joined the team uh, in April and at the same time I'm a member of the International Council for Education, Air Sensor Integration in the Executive Com Committee. So our goals in um, Autism Center of Excellency is to be the leading center in Saudi Arabia. And not only on Saudi Arabia, we're hoping to be the leading center that provide evidence-based approaches uh, in the region and the Middle East. We, ha we have set our objectives. We are a newly established center and we have already set our objectives. Um, deliver the leading model of care uh, for autism in Saudi Arabia, enhance the professional capabilities for ASD support and service delivery, develop and promote productive potential and self-reliance person with ASD, uplift the national support landscape for ASD, and enhance uh, and enable um, youth individual with ASD to have better accommodation um, and sustainable organization. 
We are very, very uh, uh, grateful for our uh, funders. All the banks of Saudi Arabia have collectively uh, worked together to support our center. And we are very, very grateful for their uh, support uh, to establish uh, Autism Center of Excellency. So um, I was thinking to talk about, as we're gonna celebrate the historic event of recognizing ASI, by the National Clearing House. So maybe many, some of you guys may not heard about the National Clearing House. So I wanna just give you guys a brief review about it. The National Clearing House on Autism Evidence and Practice conducted recently in 2020 or completed in 2020 and published their systematic review of the current intervention um, and literature targeting individual with ASD. Their review was um, completed and included all the research published through 2011 and they review all the studies published between 2012 and 17, which examined the impact of behavioral, educational, clinical and developmental practices and service model used with individual and autism spectrum from birth all the way to 20, 22 years old. They acknowledge that the literature is expanding. And that's why they're hoping to have an active yearly review. And instead of every five years, they're hoping that they're gonna have an active yearly review that will provide families, policymaker, practitioner, researcher with more timely update of the evidence-based approaches. Um, they are hoping that their work will yield to expand the evidence per evidence-based practice to adult with autism. Maybe people will say, why do we celebrate this recognition? Because NCAAP um, uh, recent report was funded by NIH and was funded by the Department of Education uh, in the US. And you, uh, usually a lot of stakeholders and educators and, and families and policymaker relies on these reports to fund such services. So first let's talk about um, our um, panelists. We have Dr. Roseanne Schaff from Thomas Jefferson University. We have uh, Dr. Sarah Schoen from Star Institute, Dr. Diana Parham from University of uh, North, of University of um, New Mexico, Dr. Shirley Lane and Dr. Anita ba Bundy from uh, uh, Colorado State University and the co-founder of uh, CLASI, Collaborative for Leadership and Air Sensor Integration, Dr. Zoe Mayo and Dr. Suzanne smith Rowley and the director of um, Spiral Foundation, Dr. Theresa May Benson. So I would like to start this panel by asking um, uh, Dr. Roseanne Schaff and maybe Dr. Sarashon, one of you guys can um, give us a little bit of an overview. How did we reach that recognition? If we can go um, um, a little bit on the past 17 years and talk about your guys' effort and research uh, I think that would give uh, our audience a little bit of a feedback, uh, a little bit of a background. Okay, thank you, Sultan. And uh, Sarah, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll go first. Sure, sure. Yep. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for hosting this. And I think we should just take a moment and celebrate this because it is a huge achievement that um, truly took a village to get to this point in having air sensory integration recognized as an evidence-based intervention. And it built on Dr. Ayer's work from the beginning and then continued with, you know, um, creating a goal to study the intervention and evaluate its effectiveness. And that step in and of itself took many people providing many pieces, including you know, the vision for it, the components that were needed, like a fidelity measure, uh, a um, objective uh, standardized outcome measure like goal attainment scaling, 
and an intervention manual that could be replicated to guide the intervention. And so um, I think it's a tribute to all of the people who have been working in the field of air sensory integration and the collaborative efforts that we've done together in order to do this. Um, so I also wanna acknowledge, uh, I think a seminal article that made a big difference in this report, which was Jane K. Smith for Stodd and Weaver's article in 2015 that clearly laid out the difference between air sensory integration and sensory based interventions for those inside and outside the field of occupational therapy. And if you read through the report, you'll notice that they considered this when they were evaluating the evidence <coughs> and that they clearly separated air sensory integration from other sensory interventions, which was key to evaluating the evidence and finding effectiveness. So I'll just say that. And then I'll also say that, uh, you know, doing the intervention research that helped lead to the, it being evidence-based, again, was a big effort and a team effort. And I have to acknowledge Dr. Zoe Mayu, who really helped shape the intervention study and Dr. Suzanne smith Rowley, who continues to help with it, um, by doing the fidelity uh, checks. I don't know if I mentioned the fidelity instrument was another important step toward uh, creating evidence and assuring that it was, our research was accepted uh, outside in the scientific community uh, because it had high rigor. And certainly the fidelity measure was one of those things that allowed us to do that. Um, and so, you know, having, uh, Conducting the intervention research, oh, I was acknowledging people. I also want to acknowledge the team at Children's uh, Specialized Hospital, Joanne Hunt, Patty Fowler, Olka Van Hudonk, Donna Kelly, and Regina Freeman, who continue to support the work that we do and um, be strong advocates for AIRS sensory integration. So um, truly it's an achievement and um, it's an honor really to be a part of a group of persons who have worked so uh, persistently and, and with such high rigor uh, to achieve this honor. Did you want me to continue? Yeah, you can go ahead, Sarah. Terrific, yeah. Um, I, I, wanna, I, I want to um, acknowledge all of the things um, Roseanne, that you started to talk about in terms of the importance of this group um, as a um, committed group from day one to building evidence and sensory integration to the kind of teamwork um, that got, was essential to getting us to this point. Um, and really every member of this panel really played a really critical role in bringing us to this point, um, as you stated. And I, I think it really began with the efforts to register air sensory integration um, as a, a standalone um, intervention. Um, and as you said, I think those key components of the manualized approach, the fidelity measure, as well as the procedures and guidelines for using goal attainment as a sensitive outcome measure. Um, to get that recognition. And I, I too feel the, um, the sort of momentous nature, I guess, of where we are in time after 17 years of everyone's dedicated work towards this. Um, I, I know that there are a lot of clinical, educational, and research implications that we're gonna talk about. Um, I was teaching the other day, and the clinician was commenting about how uh, difficult it was for her to get determinations for being able to administer AIRS SI um, and also for the appropriate frequencies and intensity of, in, of, of uh, therapy sessions that she was trying to um, get approval for. And the interesting thing was is that she drew upon both of these reports as well as the original studies themselves to present to insurance companies that she was dealing with. Um, and there was no refuting it. 
there was, it, it's such a strong piece of information to be shared with the, the clinical world out there um, about the applicability of air sensory integration, about the evidence that's now um, available. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to mention was that I, what I thought was really noteworthy, obviously, Roseanne, what you talked about was how important it is for researchers and clinicians to collaborate together. Um, and I was really surprised in both of the reports what an important role smaller studies, um, what are called single case designs or single subject research designs played in evaluating the evidence, not necessarily for AIRS SI, but for other interventions that are also recognized as being um, evidence-based practices for individuals on the autism spectrum. Um, and the reason why I mention that is because um, not everybody can get the wonderful grants that you've gotten, um, Roseanne, to be able to do the kind and level of studies through randomized controlled trials um, and what is involved both from a time and money commitment, which is huge and which we are so grateful for you having achieved. But to consider that um, these single subject designs could be a mechanism for researchers and clinicians to collaborate in smaller studies on individuals who might be on their client load um, using the same criteria that go into any research study that is addressing the manualized approach, the fidelity measure, and the sensitive outcome measures. Um, but that this might be a new avenue through which we can build our base of evidence. Um, I would like to uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sarah Sharon and Dr. Rosanchev, uh, for going through the background and acknowledging all these people. And I think we didn't have the chance this year, sadly, to honor Dr. Jane Ayers and her 100th um, birthday due to um, COVID-19. But I think this recognition of her work is such an, um, uh, a great gift for her legacy that you guys and many of you were her student and you continued her work and her research and you developed and you moved on. Um, I was thinking, um, I, I wonder if, what are the implication of this report recognition that ASI is evidence-based practice now? And I wonder if um, either Dr. Diana Parham or Dr. Shelley Lane can add something to that and can answer this question. Um, yeah, I'm going to jump in because I've really uh, been thinking about this um, quite a bit. And Sultana, I'm so glad that you um, mentioned a little bit of background about the NCAEP, that National Clearinghouse on Autism Evidence and Research, that published the report recently naming sensory integration as an evidence-based practice. Um, and so I want to say uh, that, first of all, this comes after the systematic review that Sarah Schoen et al. Um, had published, I think it's 2019, and that was a systematic Correct. review. And I think many of us here on the call were authors, um, and uh, maybe all of us, I'm not sure. Um, and that was so important uh, that we were able to show that we do meet the criteria of an organization called the Council for Exceptional Children um, uh, which is an organization in the United States. It is the leading um, professional organization for uh, teachers, for educators who work with children who have special needs. And of course, autism spectrum disorder is a, a major concern for this group of professionals. So um, it was really a, a landmark article that um, showing it all that article um, showed that we do have that evidence. Now, what's especially delightful to me about this new report out of North Carolina is that there were no occupational therapists on the review panel. I'm pretty sure about that. Um, and so um, that's sort of an extra bonus. This is another uh, organization, their own team, uh, looked at the evidence. I, I went online and was looking at this. Their backgrounds are special education, early intervention, 
speech language therapy, a behavioral economics, and library science. So these people didn't have a stake in, you know, sensory integration looking good. They just looked at the evidence and sure enough, we met their criteria for an evidence-based practice. Um, now, this is an organization that's been doing these reports over 30 years now, about 30 years now. And um, so the sensory integration is one of five uh, new uh, evidence-based practices that, was, that were uh, added to this organization's list of evidence-based practices. So it's just wonderful that um, we're being recognized and I think rightfully so because of the work that's been done and already we've heard about, you know, the fidelity measure being important, the, the randomized trials critical uh, in this uh, process. So um, I do want to mention that um, the, the, this uh, National Clearinghouse does reach a very large audience internationally. So according to their website, they have, uh, they have international users representing more than 170 uh, different locations. Hello? We lost your voice, Dr. Uh... Sultan, yeah. Yeah, we lost her voice. Mm -hmm. I Diane? can just maybe uh, yeah. um, underscore and maybe uh, summarize that, that I, mm. I believe Diane was, was trying to emphasize that this is an unbiased, objective, external. Okay, I think I'm back now. Can you oh, hear good. me? Good. Yeah. good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thank great. you so much, Roseanne. Go ahead, Dr. Parham. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Whatever happened. Thank you for filling in for me. I'm glad I'm back. I think I was just when I cut out. I think I was just mentioning that 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 um, the, the website with the the new report that just came out from the NCAEP. Um, they've had 12 million page views so far. So that's really exciting to see that this information is getting out. All right. So um, I'm not sure if I Dr. used Parham, up my time. Why while you have the mic, do you mind talking a little bit about the fidelity measure and how important that you, you were the first author, if, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and you published the first one in 2007, and how that was um, a game changer in terms of impro uh, improving the, um, uh, or the quality of the service, occupational therapists who are trained in ASI were able to provide. Um, would you mind talking a little bit about it? Yeah, certainly, and thank you for that opportunity. Um, I want to start by acknowledging Lucy Miller because Lucy, oh gosh, this must have been around 2005. I'm not sure if that's the exact year, year but about then. She received a, a fairly small grant, but from, I think it was an NIH grant and it was a planning grant around uh, children with, or infants and young children with disability. It was fairly broad. But, but she gathered, many of us that are on this call, uh, gathered us together, and uh, she said, what we really need, this is the feedback I'm getting from grant renewers, grant, re, excuse me, reviewers, that we need to have a fidelity measure, and we need to have a manualized intervention, and we need to also have physiological measures um, documenting that um, uh, our theory is on the right track in terms of the underlying neural processes that af affect children's behavior and functioning when they have sensory integration difficulties. So um, now um, Dr. Miller ended up kind of going in, a, in a, another way. She had a lot of projects going on and, and de devoted herself to a different project, but um, the rest of us kept working on these projects. So the fidelity measure, um, it was a whole group effort. I, I was the lead author on the first couple of articles, but it's really clear to me, I, there's no way I could have done this leadership role without having the help of many, many people. Um, as, and I'm going to especially acknowledge Suzanne Smith Rowley and Zoe Mayu um, because of the way that they leveraged their international conferences 
um, to bring together experts who contributed to the um, refinement of the fidelity measure and the reliability and validity data for it. So um, many people contributed to that. But I think it's been really important not only to have the fidelity measure to document that therapy is being provided the way it should be in a study of sensory integration. That's the primary purpose. But also, it's been a vehicle for communicating to people within and outside of the field of occupational therapy what exactly this intervention should look like, what it consists of. And it's building directly on Ayers' work, the, the principles and the, the uh, things that the therapist should be doing in a, in a sensory integration session come directly from Ayers' work. Um, and I've reflected so many times uh, with the shown article and now with this, uh, the University of North Carolina, the NCAEP uh, report, uh, how wonderful it is now that we have this evidence. And it's been a lot of work uh, over many years. I, and I, I wish Jean Ayers was here to, to see this point. And maybe in, and maybe in some dimension she's, she's seeing this and knowing that this is happening. But I, I know that she uh, had a very hard time. She was very, very criticized. Um, ostracized often for her work because it's, it, she was just ahead of her time. She was, she was a genius, really. She was a brilliant woman and persisted because of her commitment to truth. Um, and so I'm, I'm just happy that we've uh, had this group and not just the people on this call, but many other people who've done research in this area and made critical contributions. I'm so happy that we've persisted and persisted. Thank you so thank you so much, Dr. Diana Param, um, Dr. Um, Shelley Lane. If you could just um, add, if you would like to add anything to what they have said, and there's another question I would like to ask the panel as well: How can OTs in a clinical practice contribute to evidence of ASI, like clinician OT? and how that will influence the upcoming NSP report in 2021. You have the mic, Dr. Shelley Lane. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would, I think, like to, um, in some respects, build on what's already been said, but also point to the fact that one of the implications of this outcome from um, North Carolina is that clinicians now can take this um, evidence-based practice manuscript to their um, administrators and say, look, this has been now documented. And we have the researchers in this group um, who, whose material actually contributed to this determination. Um, one of those, of course, being Roseanne, who's on this call, but also Beth Pfeiffer, who's not on this call, um, to thank for that. Because as Diane already said, the uh, incredible amount of energy, effort, brain power, and just day-to-day -day work that went into those studies is, um, is powerful. Um, I also want to tap into what Sarah said earlier about the strength of single subject design. I think this is a place where clinicians can contribute. And if you look at this report, some of the other evidence-based practices are actually built on a large number of single subject design studies. Um, and this may be a model that we can uh, propagate. We have to do it carefully and we have to do it well with high rigor and a good eye towards scientific inquiry, but it is within the grasp of clinicians um, if they have the time and energy to do that. I also just wanna take this opportunity to point out that when we did this review, we looked at um, research that was international, and that's a tribute to 
all of our colleagues around the world and the wonderful work that they're doing. Um, some of those studies didn't quite meet all the criteria to be classified as an evidence-based practice, but it's really clear that there is an international effort being made to substantiate the work that we embrace with, um, with this particular systematic review. The other thing I wanted to make mention of was the number of different outcome measures. And I'm gonna look over at my other screen here um, to see what the, this report identified as outcome measures. And they include communication, social skills, cognitive skills, academic and pre-academic, adaptive behavior and self-help, challenging and interfering behavior and motor skills. And if you read that list and look back at what Dr. Ayers originally suggested to us and was saying, you know, back in the 1960s and 1970s, these outcomes that are identified in this report are very consistent with what she told us back then. And I think the enduring nature of of the foundation that she provided us um, gives us strength in how we now go forward and present um, these findings. Um, Dr. Shelley Lane? Yes. Um, uh, while you are talking about the outcome measure, and maybe Dr. Anita Bundy can add in, uh, considering your enormous work and extensive work in a play, how would we, um, I, I know you could see like there is a play as an outcome measure, and we all believe that um, having an enriched sensory experiences uh, will promote play uh, with uh, children with sensory integration disorder. So um, I was wondering for future study, what would you have as a suggestion to um, assess a play as an outcome after the provision of ASI intervention? So, Tan, I think that's a really good question because it is notably not ticked in this report yeah. as an outcome measure. Anita, do you want to jump in here? Okay. Anita, you're um, muted still. Sorry. Clearly, I think that play is an important outcome, and I'm not alone in this panel of people who does think that. Um, there are relatively few um, measures of play that are available. So I, I like to think of play as um, um, forming, multi, or having, being comprised of multiple components. So if we were using different measures to look at play, we have to think, am I looking at play itself, um, the, the occupation of play? Am I looking at the skills that contribute to play, the motor skills, the social skills? Um, am I looking at how the environment is contributing to play? Am I looking at the approach to play, the playfulness of play? So um, I, I think it's, it's really important. It is an important outcome. It is a neglected outcome, but it is really important to think about if you're using it as an outcome measure, um, what aspect of play are you actually using? And I think at the same time, um, setting goals with families um, in terms of if my child played better, what would that look like? And it's not as simple as answering that question, I don't think, um, because I, I often think that families are driven to um, answer that question in the way they think therapists want them to answer the question. So I think they're often driven to talk about, about age-appropriate play, if you will. And, um, you know, play actually belongs to the player. So um, it's, it's difficult, I think, sometimes to define it. But I guess the long and short of it is use, being very careful about the outcome measures you're using and being really good about setting goals with families, with teachers, and with, about educating people about what is play, actually. If we made it better, what, what would it be? 
Mm-hmm. Would you, um, Dr. Anita Bundy, would you suggest any outcome measure that could be taken into account on uh, future um, studies, like uh, single design studies that therapists could use? I know your measure of outcome is great, but I could be biased by saying that, but because uh, <laughs> I love it. Um, and I, um, but I, I wonder if, because we do, you know, it's even ASI as a, an approach is uh, where we see the child's actively playing with, um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, within the session. And at the same time, we believe as an occupational therapist that play is the main occupation for especially toddlers. Um, and preschoolers to learn about their skills. So would you add anything along that line? Well, I think the the observation measures are probably the best to use in terms of um, single case design. But Mm -hmm. but what you're looking at when you're doing single case design is you have to have a measure that's okay for, for looking at it repeatedly so that there's not learning attached to it. So I, I do think sometimes that the, I, that the observation measures, the test of playfulness, I might have a bit of bias there as well, I think is a, is a good outcome measure. If you're looking at the skills that children use, the Knox preschool play scale measure is a good observation um, measure. But what, whatever you're using, you really have to be clear that it can be used as a repeated measure. And I think for clinicians, single case design is a brilliant way to look at um, at an outcome and to do- document progress, but it is not as easy to do as we often think it is. So I think pairing up with researchers who have done that and who have, um, you know, sort of figured out some of the ropes around it is really essential. And the other thing I think about clinicians who want to contribute to research is um, consider going to graduate school and they're pairing up with researchers who. Um, can help you to to develop studies in good ways. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bundy. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering um, uh, about um, how would we take it from now? Where would we go from now? You know, like a lot of clinicians would say, you guys are researcher, put us in a track, right? Where should we start <laughs> from? And, you know, I... I don't know, from, for example, I'm just going to reflect on my experience being um, asked to establish the occupational therapy department at this newly established design, newly established autism center is setting the rule of evidence-based practice. For example, while I'm sitting the um, uh, department there, we are planning to um, train our uh, newly hired on the gazetting and scaling and the um, data decision making uh, model that was issued by Dr. Rosan Schaaf and Zoe Mayo um, because this is how evidence is showing in addition to you know um, pursuing advanced clinical practice in air sensory integration so I wonder if Dr. Zoe Mayo can add to that because since 2011, she's been telling me precise assessment yields to precise intervention. Right, Zoe? <laughs> That's the mantra. Um, oh, yeah. Yes, and, and just to build on that, I think reflecting, listening to everyone's thoughts here, there's really a theme of being systematic, methodical, and clear. Uh, I, I think it was Sarah who referred, I'm not sure if it was Sarah Roseanne, who referred to the heiress families effort to uh, apply the trademark to the term air sensory integration. That effort, as lo- uh, along with the fidelity measure, uh, the manualization, all of these efforts have really focused on being clear and systematic. And that has provided the foundation for this kind of work to be accomplished. The same thing applies to clinical practice. And as I think all my friends know, I'm a little bit obsessed with the assessment piece because assessment is at the beginning. And if we do not have full, clear assessment, then everything that comes after that is a little bit more shaky. So uh, when we look at the studies that have been conducted and have got us to this point, the, and, and also reflecting back on Dr. Ayer's work, 
all of that was built on careful systematic assessment. So that's why I'm constantly singing that song. Um, and I think in clinical practice, we can do that. We can be much more careful in how we plan our practice uh, to be uh, more systematic in the way that we collect our own data and follow it. Um, Roseanne's uh, efforts to encourage occupational therapists to display their outcomes, to track outcomes, has been so important because this hasn't really been part of our culture in occupational therapy as much as it is in some of the other professions. And the more that we do that, then I think these ideas of single subject studies can be much more impactful. Uh, the other point I just want to make is, again, to, to echo the acknowledgement of the international community. I think that in some ways, some of the practices in the United States were getting really messy. Uh, lots of sensory this and sensory that before we started having a little bit more of these definitions. But the rest of the world really embraced and understood Dr. Ayer's work in a way that was uh, exceptionally powerful. And I think we do want to acknowledge that um, we do have replication studies that have occurred or are occurring. Dr. Claudia Amari, I think, is with us today in the attendees. And she replicated uh, the first randomized control trial that Dr. Schaff had performed with her team. And also in the UK, some of our UK colleagues are here under the direction of Dr. Sue Delport, who is currently replicating a study. So, you know, it, as much as uh, I'm joining everyone in the celebration, I also was a little bit humbled by the number of studies for sensory integration. It's, uh, it's fantastic that we meet the criteria, but we're not done and we need, we need many, many more studies. So we can only do that with our whole global uh, community who's working in the same direction. Uh, while we have you uh, here, Dr. Zawemeyo, would you um, mind just giving the, our audience uh, a little bit of feedback about the ASI Vision 2020 and the effort you have made, you and many of our colleagues through studies and reviewing research and reviewing um, evidence which led to the systematic review that many of you guys have published and the first author was Dr. Sarah Sean. And maybe Dr. Sarah Sean as well, if she wanna add after Dr. Zoe May, that would be amazing. Go ahead, Dr. Zoe. Yeah, sure, so I think that most of the people joining us probably know that in 2014, we set a vision for 2020. Uh, I think every day I'm just amazed at how well our vision has uh, materialized. And this, this is like a special gift to have this publication come out this year. Uh, but an international group set a vision for what would we like to see for Aris Sensor Integration by the year 2020, which was chosen because it was a commemoration of Dr. Ayer's 100th birthday. And it included um, scholarship, clarity and assessment, and international standards for training and education. And by having, I mean, the scholarship goal, we, we have a specific goal around having publications, but this publication is so important for, I mean, Diane sharing that it's already had 12 million views. That's just amazing for our vision of seeing Ayer's work as being internationally recognized as evidence-based. We've uh, developed an open access test, the evaluation in Ayer's sensory integration, uh, we currently have, I think, a, around 1,500 children tested globally. There's been a bit of a pause because of the pandemic. Um, I don't know, maybe another little uh, kind of a unusual gift that we're getting a little more time because I think our international community might have needed a little more time to collect data. But we have um, now, again, close to 100 countries participating, collecting normative data. And we will have a comprehensive assessment that we hope will make it much more practical for therapists around the world to conduct comprehensive assessments. And then the wonderful work that's been done by the International Council for Education and Air Sensory Integration. I know you're part of that, Sultan. Um, that Paolo is uh, the president of this emerging organization with many of our colleagues from other countries contributing. Um, 
to set international standards that will keep us on track so that we can have many more studies and that we really can see this vision uh, realized, which I, I think we're really close. And I think it's amazing that for this 100th year, um, we, can, we can really acknowledge these accomplishments. Thank you, Dr. Zoe Mayo. And before I um, uh, give the mic to Dr. Benson and Dr. Suzanne Smithrodi, because both of them are still uh, a practicing clinician and they own their own clinic. Uh, and they are a great clinician, I would say, but I'm maybe biased by saying this. But uh, I would love to share with you guys something that uh, on Saturday, uh, Autism Center of Excellency, we uh, actually had a panel, a local panel, and we interviewed one of the reviewer who happened to be a Saudi PhD uh, graduate uh, from University of Oregon who has an ABA background, and he has shared with us that um, that one of the limitation of this report that the majority were from the ABA field, um, and he mentioned that how much this report is really really influencing a lot of insurance companies, and influencing a lot of policymaker and stakeholders, and he um, was he he was even really really happy that other evidence-based practice like ASI has been finally recognized because as many of us know that majority of parents or majority of uh, intervention that are provided in pediatric setting in the US and outside the world uses the principle of ASI. Um, and I, I was really, really happy to hear that from someone who is not an occupational therapist, but who is an ABA working in the US and was part of this uh, group. And I have a feeling that as they're going to report uh, or they're going to review on a year yearly basis, that's going to have a, an impact on the APA um, and the uh, uh, next NSP report and the American Pediatric um, Association and other report. And the more research we have, I'm sure the better outcome we will build in the future. Um, would you like to add anything being as a clinician, Dr. Theresa May Benson or Suzanne, um, how would you take that to practice? Like, how would you take this to your practice? How would you take this report to your practice and translate it to your clinician and at the same time to the parent? Well, I think there's, for me, there's a couple of things um, because I play the role of both a clinician and as well as a researcher. Um, most of my research is clinic-based research. Um, so we're in that category of people that do try to clinic-based you know, studies. Uh, and I think for the, the clinician, there's a couple of pieces that I think we need to kind of be aware of. Um, first is that there are several different groups that put out guidelines for what's considered evidence-based practice. Um, this is one, and it's uh, one of the most um, recognized, which is awesome. Um, we mentioned also the Ch uh, Center for Exceptional Children that our uh, paper, the Shown at All paper that's in Autism Research supported. Um, but there's also the um, publication put out by Autism Speaks, um, which is still now a year or two behind the uh, Frank Porter Graham or, uh, organization. And so as, as clinicians out in the field, what we need to do is to make sure that therapists are aware of these multiple guidelines and where we stand across these, because we still have to get now into the Autism Speaks um, group, okay, and get their recognition as well. Um, I posted this great um, result, for instance, on Facebook. And one of the first things that came back from a comment from a therapist was, um, mm, well, there's only two studies in 30 years? I don't think so, you know? And it was like, well, but we meet the criteria. 
And she's like, yeah, but there's only two studies. So, you know, what we've been talking about in terms of needing more research is really important. Supporting what we have done and the importance of what we've done um, is real important to the ASH clinician because they're still going to be influenced by um, other, other people. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, I think the other that's real important is to look at what we need to do with other populations because this, this guideline is for children with autism and the studies that have been done have been on autism. Um, so we need continued research in with, uh, you know, your average SI child, you know, um, other populations that we do. SI with, that's, yeah, yeah, individual specifically with praxis issues. I mean, all of these kinds of things, we need continued research. And so that's where the therapists can come into play with, as you were talking about the single disease. Those are fabulous for getting at many of these sort of other populations. Um, be really good for looking at what does SI do for, you know, the child with PANDAS or whatever that, you know, you, are you using SI with other populations? So these single case studies can be really helpful for that. So as a clinician, I think those are, that's a great role for the, the, the clinician therapist um, to look at. Um, and I think we have to be aware that it's going to take um, a little bit of catch up time for some of these other or organizations to come to the same conclusions about evidence, SI being evidence based practice. Um, you know, we still have some of the Australian groups saying, well, SI's, you know, in the don't do it zone because they haven't seen this, this, this document yet. Um, so we just have to keep getting the great word out about the, the, this document and getting it out there so that clinicians know that it's available now. Um, and I think that's, that's gonna be a really important clinical piece. It's continuing to spread the word such as this is gonna do. And Teresa, Dr. Teresa, while you are here, because you are amazing in praxis, uh, how would you see <laughs> how would you see that having praxis as one of the measure of outcome for individual with autism that we could because I think ASI will have as we said about play, I would say even praxis if we have it as an outcome measure, would you think that would be a great um, tool to use about the importance of ASI? as an intervention with individual with autism? I think that looking at changes in praxis is really important. Uh, I think what we have to always be thinking about with our outcome measures is what's functional um, and keeping our eye on, on, on functional outcome measures because that's what's really important to families. So we can use those praxis measures as one piece but it would, we wouldn't want it, that foundational type of an outcome to be the only outcome that we're looking at. We wanna make sure that we're looking at, well, so what does praxis allow us to do functionally? Does it allow that child to get dressed better, to be able to engage in play better, to be able to you know, do um, the everyday motor skills that children need to do better? Um, so kind of looking at it from across those perspectives, I think would be really important. Thank you so much, Dr. Theresa May Benson. Dr. Uh, Suzanne smith Rowley, you have been known uh, in Southern California and the US and internationally for your advocacy for parents um, to have um, uh, services and to have occupational therapy services and air sensor integration uh, services. And I can't ask for a better one than you to talk about that implication for uh, the implication of this report to clinician in um, the school setting, um, as you've been advocate uh, in a lot of the IEP meeting, how would you take that report uh, with you in everyday practice? Okay, well, thank you, Sultan, for organizing this and for the International Council for supporting it and also the, all the people on the panel. It's a it's a pretty humbling panel to be part of. It's a, it's a lot of brain power here uh, 
I really appreciate uh, being part of this team and having been part of the SI Research Collaborative for so many years. So um, thank you all and for everybody who's not here because so many people have contributed including the Ayers family and all of the researchers. Uh, so anyway, thank you to everyone. Um, and, and about your question, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to address that sort of dovetailing onto everything everybody has already said. Um, I, I just want to say that this report was a, a, a huge gift. Um, you know, I hadn't anticipated it. Teresa made us aware of it, and it was just amazing. And uh, so it, it kind of supersedes some of the other publications that have come out maybe you know, in the 90s or the early 2000s. And I think this is something that, that practitioners want to have in their hands and say, oh, you're, you're talking about a criticism that came out a long time ago. Here, look at this one. Right. You know, here's this, uh, along with our 2018 shown at all article, the systematic review. These two documents are very powerful and should supersede the criticism that said there isn't enough research in SI. Of course, there's never enough research in anything. We need, you know, we're, we, we're continuing to work, but, but we have achieved a level of acceptability. And I think this is something to get out into the community, particularly I want to mention occupational therapy, because this intervention isn't a standalone. It, it's contextualized within the profession of occupational therapy. The work has been done by occupational therapists. And so, uh, this is also something that I think OTs should be very proud of, that, that we have an intervention coming out of our discipline that's contextualized within our discipline. Certainly other disciplines have used SI more or less and are very interested in sensory integration, but really it has its best home in occupational therapy. Now, that being said, occupational therapy practitioners um, need to use best practice. And so this is something that I think has, is a continuing area of education for us all over the world. Um, yeah. We were trained uh, as students of Dr. Ayers to do best practice, to do research, to follow the neuroscience, and we worked hard. And people weren't paying for this. this <laughs> we did a lot of things that that weren't necessarily immediately reimbursable. And we have continued to this day, including self-funding our own you know, little projects. So, um, so I would encourage therapists to continue to strive for best practice. And that means that you are updating your own knowledge in the, in the science that comes out because maybe there's things that we discover that refine our knowledge that, or change our thinking about something. And then you have to do a comprehensive assessment. So as Zoe had mentioned, you know, you have to characterize the SI concerns. You have to do the best assessment possible. So not just, oh, this child has autism, let's do sensory stuff. And, and well, does that child with autism, what kind of issues are there you know how do you have that more precision intervention as as Roseanne has talked about in her publications and lectures and and then how do you practice so so what kind of intervention then are you going to practice I mean because it's it, you know it became very popular for a while to do a weighted vest or uh, you know a a sit and move cushion and call it a day. And we know that that just doesn't work. We never thought that that was going to work. But you have to have enough space. You have to have equipment. You have to practice with the fidelity to the intervention. So, um, and what this means is that therapists can't compromise the integrity of their practice by saying, well, okay, but I don't have any space to work. I don't have any equipment to work. Oh, I don't have time for assessment. If you do that, if practitioners do that, they will not be engaged in evidence-based practice. And so this is something to be, um, you know, to, to kind of stick to your guns. Do not acquiesce to a reduction in the quality of your services. Do not take shortcuts. 
that then leads you to an outcome that's less than optimal because you didn't do it in the way that it's really designed or maybe done from a reductionistic perspective of just sensory stuff. Let's just do sensory stuff. And anybody could do that sensory stuff. You know, well, who, you know, we can play with Play-Doh. We don't need an OT. That, that's not going to get us further because practice does drive research as much as research drives practice. These are interconnected. And so as practitioners see the changes in the children that they work with or not, like this child's not changing, what are we doing? We need to do something different. Or we're going, oh my goodness, the parents are telling me this is magic. What have we done? That informs the research for understanding the future of this method to refine the method so that we can do it more quickly. We have faster outcomes, more measurable outcomes. Um, and you know now we're challenged with COVID-19 and so people are doing it with telehealth. And so you know we're having some successes with that, certainly some frustrations. But you know, what, what are the modifications of this method from the way that it's been researched that will continue to be as powerful or maybe uh, more powerful? And then I just want to say one more thing because I appreciate the work of this group so much and we've uh, collaborated on many projects and one of the, the, the papers I got to see this week that we're working on is the one on the family life impact questionnaire. And I just want to thank everybody, especially Anita and Zoe and um, everybody who encouraged us to continue. But this is an occupational profile of a sort to say, you know, how are things doing? Like Teresa mentioned in those real usual daily activities, getting dressed, <laughs> doing homework, transitioning, getting out of the door. Um, and we will have a, it looks like we're having an article pretty close to submission. So we're working on that, that maybe this in the future could be a potential outcome measure. So, so we're, we're continuing to try to create these clinical tools and support the practitioners as much as possible also in our education programs. The other thing I would say around- Can I say something, uh, Teresa, just about the life, if you don't yep. mind, about this questionnaire, yep. Dr. Suzanne smith Roley has said it, and this questionnaire will be available in many languages. Uh, I had the honor to translate the Arabic. Maybe Zoe may you can um, update us how many languages this measure have been um, translated to before we norm it. Zoe? Yes. Uh, well, I'm not sure. I think it's at least 15 to 20 uh, that we have it translated for the normative data collection, which is underway. So. Uh, Thank you so much. That, Zoe. In that range, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, Dr. Benson. That's okay. Um, so what I, what I was going to say um, is that the family impact questionnaire started as a, a clinical measure that you guys were using in the clinic. And through your efforts to really standardize it and, and, and do all the psychometric testing and things on it, now you've got a great, great tool that we can use for an outcome measure. So as we think about what can clinicians do, you know, we're really there's so a lot of really creative clinicians out there and you have guys have got lots and lots of tools and measures that you've developed for your clinical practice to capture those meaningful uh, behaviors and outcomes and skills. And I'd encourage people to look at what you have in the clinic and see what, what do you need to do to do the psychometric testing on those measures to develop them a little bit more so you can ha use them officially as measures. You know, many of the things that we use today started as clinical measures um, because they rose out of clinical necessity. And clinicians have a lot to offer. And that test development kind of thing is something that clinicians can do, you know. It, the, they, they can do a lot of that kind of work um, and really help, you know, I think that's a great pl um, place to contribute that has untapped at this point. Thank you so much, Dr. Benson. And before I forget, I would love to 
honor all other researchers who didn't have the chance to join us. And many researchers have, as Dr. Zoe Mayu and others, and Dr. Zanchap, and the, uh, um, all of the panelists have acknowledged. And even um, I would say like few, I extended the, inv the invitation to them, Dr. Christy Koenig and Dr. Um, Elizabeth Pfeiffer, who uh, shared uh, their regards to you guys and would have loved to join us, but they had other commitments. And I think I would love to honor their contribution to this report as well. Um, we are almost over an hour now. If you don't mind, uh, panelists, if we uh, could uh, go to Dr. Uh, Rosanne Schaaf for closing uh, statement, but we are open if you want to add anything. Um, Dr. Rosanne Schaaf, I Thank wonder you. if um, just a question came in my mind. As many of us, we have many um, have joined us in today's webinar with the COVID-19 and using the telehealth. Uh, how would you see occupational therapists using other approach that's been shown that it's been an evidence-based practice like video modeling and incorporate that within ASI treatment? How would you see that as an area of contemporary practice that occupational therapists, I would argue that could maybe um, contribute in that research? That's a great question, Sultan. And I think I'll come back to a point that um, Zoe made about um, being systematic in our approach. Um, so I wanna say a few things and then I'll come back to the telehealth. First, uh, what I wanna say about the research is to acknowledge that air sensory integration is a complex intervention. And that it takes sophistication and skill in order to do it. And so please practice it in its evidence-based way. Now, this it doesn't mean that as an occupational therapist or a physical therapist or whatever your clinical training is in, that you, you have uh, the professional freedom to look at your client's needs and then craft interventions that are gonna match what it is that you think are gonna help them meet um, their, their goals and their participation challenges. So using something like video modeling, you, I wouldn't call it using it as part of air sensory integration in its evidence-based way, but certainly you're practicing in your clinical expertise and using the tools that are at your disposal. Um, so that's one point I wanted to make. And, and the other point I wanted to make is to, uh, I don't want to see us uh, become overly zealous uh, about the evidence and understand um, the boundaries of it. Uh, the evidence that we have now is for using occupational therapy with air sensory integration for children with autism. Children, specifically children five and a half to nine, nine years, 11 months. <laughs> and this is a start. It's a big start, but we need so much more as everyone has spoken to. Hey, listen, doing intervention research is hard. It takes, you know, a lot of money. It takes a lot of personal uh, cost and effort. It takes a lot of collaboration. So I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I wouldn't underestimate um, you know, the kind of work that still needs to be done. We do need to expand the evidence for air sensory integration to other clinical populations. We need to extend it to other age groups. Uh, we fortunately just got funded for a study to expand it down to young children, three to five years old. So hopefully we'll be creating some evidence for that. We need biomarkers to see if you know, the theoretical um, principles about neuroplasticity really are impacted by air sensory integration. And you know, many of you know that the study that we're doing now has a biomarker of multisensory integration attached to it. And we have to see what happens with that, we have, which will help to shape and guide the further theoretical development. So I think, you know, my, my take home messages are about um, using the evidence 
that is there in a very um, professional and diligent manner. Um, when you are practicing and practice using the, the evidence-based principles. And, and if you're not, as you say, Sultan, now we're in the, the, um, the era Pandemic. of telehealth, how can we extend those principles uh, to the populations that we are working with now and, and be sure to name and frame them as they are? We, we don't wanna overstep our bounds here. Um, and be criticized then and suffer backlash from, from uh, professionals you know, outside of occupational therapy. This is a huge step forward, but we have to tread gingerly. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rosanne. Um, just before we end, I, uh, I don't know if Dr. Shelley Lane can add that, um, can step in um, before we end uh, this amazing webinar. Um, how would you see um, if we use regulation as an outcome measure as well within um, the next report? Consider, like considering your extensive work and research in uh, utilizing the alert program. Uh, that's an excellent question. I think one of the challenges that we face with that goes back to something that Zoe and Roseanne both talked to, and that is precision and measurement. And right now, our tools for measuring changes in self-regulation are, are not as precise as they need to be. Um, in fact, defining, sorry about that, Defining self-regulation is itself um, problematic because it's different no matter where you look. I think we do make changes in regulatory abilities using um, air sensory integration, but documenting it, um, I don't have any really clear ideas about that at this point in time. And I will again uh, refer to one of my uh, esteemed colleagues on this call, uh, going back to what Teresa said, we need to embed that in functional behavior. Goodness me. Um, rather than trying to isolate a uh, focus on self-regulation. So self-regulation in support of what? And uh, perhaps we need to look at those behaviors instead. Thank you so much. Uh, I wonder if any of the panelists would like to add anything before we conclude. I just wanted to acknowledge um, Jane Kumar's work because Jane is a, a really <laughs> important part of this team and we miss her so much. So I just wanted to get that in there. I'm glad you said that, Zoe. I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> she would be um, really, really happy uh, to see her today. And I'm sure Suzanne wants to say something too, but now she can't because she's choked up. <laughs> I know, you know, that makes me cry oh. that, you know, we loved her so much. But anyway, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. I'll stop yeah. there. But thank you, everyone. Yeah. All time, great job of pulling this together. It speaks to your yes. leaders that you were able to Thanks pull so much. together at the same time. And you did a really great job of uh, cutting to some of the really important issues and starting a very important conversation. So thank you. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so much, guys. Um, I feel humbled and honored. I couldn't believe that you guys will be able to give me a little bit of your time to me and to uh, um, honor ICAC uh, or ICE uh, ASI. I know you would love to acknowledge the executive committee and other members of the Congress of all their efforts to spread the words around. And I hope we were able to celebrate this and honor Dr. Jane Ayers by um, advocating and capitalizing on every 
even if we believe it's a little achievement, but I think we should capitalize on it. And um, I beg your pardon. I said it's a big achievement. <laughs> it's a big achievement. Yeah, I was talking in general. I was talking in general. It's a huge. It's a huge. Uh, you may ask my team like how, how crazy I went. I was like, yes, and I've been talking about it and highlighting the report. Um, so thank you all for listening. Thank you. I can't thank uh, the panelists for dedicating your time. Uh, during this uh, uncertain time uh, and uh, you know we I'm in Saudi Arabia you guys in different places in the state where you were able to come all together uh, so from the from the bottom of my heart I would like to thank many of you guys if you could please uh, finish the survey we would love to know what's your professional background and where are you from as this um, will help us to plan future um, uh, webinars and hopefully um, uh, conferences. Thank you so much for coming in and tuning in and I hope uh, that you all going to be able to go back to practice and take all these notes and contribute to the research and to the clinical practice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sultan. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.